Uh, so I'll discuss um, several research projects uh, that have been developed in the lab, uh, and I'll discuss the way that these these projects uh, have been um, uh, have had impact beyond their sort of initial concept, their initial idea, uh, particularly sort of projects that intersect uh, art, design, technology, uh, and health. Um, and illustrate really how sort of creative practice-led research can have significant impact across multiple uh, domains. Um, so SciArt, as it's known for short, was uh, really conceived to bring uh, research in multiple domains together with allied health sciences. Uh, and from its initial starting point in 2014, it's actually expanded into other research domains, uh, including nanoscience, uh, computer science, engineering, uh, and ethnography. Uh, and so we currently have several PhD students uh, working in these areas, uh, and two visiting uh, research fellows who are exploring art science related uh, projects. And so the common uh, thread uh, across their work is often using emerging technologies, so very much similar to Sensi Lab in some ways, and really producing new pathways for sort of creative expression by sort of developing uh, novel processes, uh, systems, and sometimes ancillary sort of intellectual property uh, as well. Uh, so this is just a few examples um, of some of the um, students and researchers who are working with us. Um, on the far left, we have uh, John, uh, John Power, uh, who's investigating how data-driven uh, generative ambient media can make spaces can places. And so this work that you can see here is installed in the Victorian Comprehensive uh, Cancer Centre, or the VCCC. Uh, the artwork's called Loc Locus Amionis, I think I pronounced that right, which translates to delightful place. Um, and it's a generative system that uh, creates a sort of a gentle journey through a naturalistic uh, landscape. Uh, and using ethnographic approaches, John's questioning how CAM technology can offer places of sanctuary for visitors and staff who use uh, this particular space. Uh, so moving along to Rakesh Patibanda, his work uh, investigated how virtual reality games can be designed for practicing uh, pursed lipped breathing, uh, which is a sort of technique to help reduce anxiety uh, and also to treat sort of pulmonary uh, breathing uh, conditions. And so he developed a project in collaboration uh, with a company called Breathing Labs uh, who are based in Slovenia. Uh, and they developed a, a VR game using um, a breathing headset that was connected to the VR uh, work. Um, uh, moving along, Trish Adams uh, is a visiting research fellow, uh, and we worked together developing a, a, a work called Disconnections, which, is an, uh, which was an exhibition of two multimedia artworks uh, created specifically to put people in the position of those with hearing loss so that they can experience firsthand the sort of sensory deprivation uh, and so social isolation that comes from hearing disability. And that was in collaboration with the Hearing CRC in Carleton. Uh, James Hullock, uh, I've worked with now for a number of years, and I'll talk a little bit more about our work together. Um, we have just recently, or continuously, developing uh, a work called Disruptive Critters, which is a hybrid uh, audiovisual interface uh, that explores performative sound art practices uh, that emerge when autonomous uh, computer-generated agents, sound, and interactivity converge. So 
uh, we're sort of investigating sort of AI techniques in sound art. So again, something that has a bit of crossover here, I think. Um, so I'll speak a little bit more about uh, Andrea Rass Russell. She's uh, a recent PhD student who, who graduated uh, earlier this year. Uh, I was her uh, senior supervisor. And she uh, developed a project called uh, wildly oscillating particles of unanticipated momentum, uh, which is a bit of a, a really great title. It's a mouthful to say. Um, uh, so Andrea, uh, she's a filmmaker <coughs> whose project was based at the Micro Nano Research Facility at RMIT. Uh, and the MNRF is a, it's a research hub with a, a clean room uh, facility uh, for fabrication and measurement and characterization of nano devices uh, between scales of one to a, a thousand uh, nanometers. So to, to put that into perspective, uh, human hair is about 50,000 nanometers in diameter. So it's really working at very small scales. And her creative practice, uh, she, her research was investigating film techniques to capture uh, what she calls suprasensible phenomena. So that's uh, of nanoscale environments. Um, and suprasensible phenomena is that which cannot be perceived by the naked eye without some form of technological mediation via sort of instrumentation, sort of hardware and, and software. Um, so the impetus, the impetus for her project uh, was to question how a filmmaker could work at the, at the nanoscale, and she adopted and sort of disrupted uh, some of the instrumentation and the techniques that the nanoscientists were using and integrating them into uh, filmmaking uh, practices. Uh, and she developed what she, a technique she called uh, endurance my, my Ugh, microscopy. Um, so the films that she's developed here, if I play one. So the one at the top is a single um, sample of graphene. It's it's fairly inert. It doesn't actually move or change much over time. Uh, to produce that four second clip. Uh, took her about eight hours of just standing over the microscope uh, to develop it. So she was just wanting to test the sort of proof of concept about how she might use uh, the device that she was using, which was called the Atomic Force Microscope, to develop these experimental films. Uh, the sec one, second one is a, a sample of uh, phosphorine, which is degrading over time. Um, the scientists who were developing flexible electronics, uh, particularly for, I think it's for, it was for a pacemaker or a heart, some sort of uh, device for the heart. Uh, the problem with phosphorine is that it degrades over time, but they couldn't actually work out why it was degrading over time. Uh, and so Andrea employed uh, the techniques that she had developed to, to film this uh, process the process that was happening and what they worked out was that the degradation was actually happening around the edge platelets of the phosphorine and they hadn't seen this before um, this resulted in a publication uh, in uh, I think it was advanced materials it's I think it's one of the top 75 journals worldwide uh, with uh, that published the results of the outcome of, of this particular work and how it actually informed uh, the scientific understanding of what what was happening to that particular material, so it was um, uh, quite phenomenal, actually. Um, so, so my own sort of uh, interdisciplinary research journey began with um, two research projects that were funded through the Australian Research Council and the Australia Council for the Arts um, Synapse Initiative. Uh, that was beginning in sort of 2006. Uh, that's uh, Elements, which is a, a virtual reality augmented workspace for movement rehabilitation of traumatic brain injury patients. 
uh, and that study is ongoing. Uh, the second work was, uh, is called Resonance, a digital media artwork for cooperative group interaction in the rehabilitation of brain injury. And that started in 2012, and that's also ongoing. And more recently, uh, another project called Playboards, which is understanding the design of playful activities on interactive surfaces to increase social participation and mobility of older residents in community care, uh, which is funded through um, the Design and Creative Practice Enabling Capability Platform at RMIT and the Eric Baker Ormond Foundation uh, in collaboration with Australian Unity. Um, and so through these, uh, the, these three projects, uh, I've formed a sort of a multidisciplinary network of teams over a more or less a 12-year period that brings together uh, expertise in digital design, games, computer science at RMIT, um, developmental psychology and neuro rehabilitation of movement and cognition uh, at Australian Catholic University, clinical psychology in understanding the emotional well-being of older adults living in residential care at Swinburne, uh, as well as physiotherapists and occupational therapists that we've been working with at the Epworth Hospital uh, and Prince of Wales Hospital uh, in Sydney. Uh, and in there as well, we have uh, James Hullock again, uh, which uh, we've been working with in community arts uh, and disability, uh, and also business strategies uh, in commercializing some of the work that we are doing. Uh, and so at, at RMIT, there's sort of a now more of a move towards translating research in multiple ways, and one of them is, is through commercializing. Uh, so our work is going through that sort of translational pathway right now in some, of our, some aspects of our, our work. Um, um, so the system we have developed is Part of these research projects uh, are a set of interactive game-like uh, applications uh, which are designed for movement rehabilitation for individuals with a brain injury such as stroke or traumatic brain injury. Um, and both the elements and resonance projects have now been combined into a product that we are currently developing which is called Edna. Um, and so the activities that the um, include um, environments that encourage sort of collaboration, challenge, and creative modes of user interaction uh, to, to engage the patients in their rehab. Um, the technology is combining a digital uh, touch table display and also tablet-based technology, uh, tangible user interfaces, uh, and a series of interactive uh, real-time environments. So, and so the participant the, or the patients uh, are using handheld objects to play a variety of games, compose with sound, create animated artwork, uh, actions that are simple in form and playful in effect, but are better accommodating the physical uh, and cognitive limitations of many of our uh, participants. So our team was, uh, took a sort of research approach that spans across design, arts, science, domains to tackle the complexity uh, uh, or the complex issues of designing for uh, brain injury. And we explored a sort of a range of uh, guiding sort of philosophies to help direct uh, the sort of design and the, and the research. Um, and to design the iterations of our system, we utilized uh, concepts from embodied interaction design uh, developed by Paul Durish as our kind of starting point, uh, which sort of provides that sort of design framework that focuses on that sort of first person lived experience and its relationship to, to the environment. So in short, we're looking to design user interfaces uh, and user interaction that's sort of more natural, tangible, and intuitive to use for, for patients. 
Now, taking a step back a little bit here, it's like, okay, how did I get here? So, um, next few slides, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the much earlier work that I did, which was really sort of where my interest between the body and the screen uh, started. Um, and in 2005, um, sort of began investigating the, the physical properties of digital media. So really treating the display as a physical material for creating uh, a work called Black on Black, White on White, which was uh, commissioned by the Australian Centre for the Moving Image uh, for display in an exhibition called White Noise. Uh, and this exhibition was exploring abstraction uh, through the moving image. So the installation consists of three ho horizontally mounted uh, LCD panels that have been stripped out of bare of their uh, enclosure. Uh, and that just reveals the LCD substrate itself. Um, and these are subdivided then into three separate rendered parts of black on black, white on white, and black on white opposites so that you could actually see what was happening. Um, so this was a, an interesting project when I pitched it to Acme, because uh, essentially I opened up my laptop, hit the play button, and it was a black screen. But you could actually see the oh, you could actually see the work. This is come off. Um, you could actually see the work by sort of extreme viewing angles. So if you actually looked at the screen with an extreme side on, you could then see the work. So it was it's very similar to sort of other minimalist artist painters at the time, like Ad Reinhardt, for example, who would paint black on black paint using paint. And the only way you could actually see the work was by changing your viewing angle to the to the actual screen. So in most cases, people went up to it and thought it was broken. But those that did actually see the work, there was a kind of a eureka moment of, wow, OK, I can see something moving here. Um, so. Um, this led to another work, which was uh, taking the, looking at liquid crystal uh, material. Um, this is a sort of a switchable glass type material that I was looking at at the time. This was a collaboration with uh, uh, Nanotechnology Victoria, Eyeglass and State Automation, uh, which was looking at uh, using liquid crystal film to develop, ooh, what's happening? Heard some crackling. <laughs> this is this is the <laughs> this is the black on black work. Mm -hmm. I oh yeah, I heard some fizzing. Yeah, everyone take a Ooh. break. Oh. Detected something. 
Yeah, yeah. Can you yes. record sound at, at a nano scale? Uh, no, so that was, um, uh, so Andrea collaborated with a, a sound artist um, to see if how they could um, add sound to the visualization, to see if that would actually yeah. help in sort of communicating the sort of the, the texture or the, you know, the, yeah. the, the sort of three dimensional sort of analogy of the image. Is there a way to record sound? Uh, well, so the AFM, it's, uh, so the atomic force microscope itself, the way that it produces the image is actually, it, 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 it's through a, a stylus that's very similar to a record player. Right. So it scans across, um, oh, there we go, um, right. Well, that looks nice from the inside. Do you want to just unplug and replug it? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um.
happens if you maximize it? It doesn't do anything. It will look like that. Cool. <laughs> Did it initiate the characters? Let me just try it on that side. Is it? So, it's because of the way these projectors work. <laughs> we go through a capture card, and the capture card's not getting the right image. That's the problem. Um, and I don't know why. Um, so it's not like I can just plug it into Can you send me the PowerPoint? We can plug it into my phone. Like, uh, just show it on the desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's quite it's big. Quite a big okay, so is that mm. It's not actually the big I've got a drive I could copy it onto. It took two seconds. Oh, it's 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 At least this is all live streaming, is it? Yeah, <laughs> 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 